In the Song of Solomon, Jesus is described as chief among 10,000 and altogether lovely. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz. Those words found in Song of Solomon chapter 5 describe our beautiful Savior, Jesus Christ. So next time you hear them sung in worship, you can be reminded of this study. Well, today we'll hear our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, share more with us about the loveliness of Jesus and the importance of not only worshiping him, but in sharing our love for him with others. And speaking of sharing our love for Jesus with others, let's take a minute to hear from and pray for our listening family in Southeastern Asia. Now, Through the Bible's President Greg Harris is here, and he's going to take us there. <laughs> well, if I took us there, it would, it's about a 15-hour flight yeah, from the wow. West Coast. So let's uh, let's enjoy the comfort of our home. Theater of the uh, mind. Theater of the mind. That's right. Um, yeah, we're talking about our ministry t- in Thailand, and uh, this is such an important and powerful part of our outreach. We've been on the air in Thai, the main language of Thailand, since 1993. Yeah, 30 years. So, yeah, that is a long time time and yeah. and again we always want to say to you our listening family thank you your faithfulness your 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 constant prayer and those of you that can support us and and feel led to support us financially that makes it possible for us to be in a tough place like Thailand for 30 years and the fruit that comes out of that it takes a long time to bear fruit yeah. in, in cultures like yep. that absolutely but not only are we going to think about the Thai ministry Thailand is also a hub for reaching many many other ethnic minority languages that part of the world has a lot of different languages a lot of tribal groups and as you love to remind our listeners we are often even more effective in those smaller languages why yeah, because there's just no other content available yeah. secular or Christian. Yeah. And so people are much more inclined to download. If we can get a, a contextualized Bible app, Dr. Yes. McGee's teaching and the Bible listed in an app store in a particular really small tribal language that nobody else is paying attention to because, oh, I don't know, there's only 10 million or 12 <laughs> right. million people yeah, in that in that right. language. It is a huge yes. opportunity for us. Yes. And we recently had one of our colleagues, uh, James, went, went out there and... Uh, as, as a number of us that have traveled internationally said, when he came back, it's in his blood. You know, he, it, he was so excited to see firsthand the impact of the ministry. And th- one of the things he wrote a little article for us uh, for our newsletter. So if you don't get the newsletter, there's great stuff. You can call 1-800-65-BIBLE and they'll sign you up and we will never send you appeal letters for money. We'll just send you blessed information but this part of what excited him about the trip you want to share a little bit about this guy that yeah, he met i'm jumping around a little yeah. bit but it says answering the question that james was posed what excites you and here's his answer he says what do you call someone who started preaching at 14 years old is one of the primary pastors of his entire people group oversees 14 churches conducts two hour long teachings every day he's got four children <laughs> but wait there's more 10 adopted children 40 students attending the Bible Institute that he started and gets this and so much more done with less than four hours of sleep every night. Man. (laughs) Yeah, I'm tired just hearing about that. Yeah, what do you call that? Well, he calls it a gut check. And what Mm. do you call meeting half a dozen Christians just as fruitful as this man? And, And James says cognitive dissonance. Yeah. Do you think I came home feeling like I was living on mission? No. And here's what I like. He said, but thank God for repentance. I might not be that fruitful today, but I can begin sowing that I might be that fruitful tomorrow. When you see the amazing work Christians can and are accomplishing around the world, it truly excites, inspires, and challenges one to want to follow them. So that is my charge to you. As they follow Christ, as Paul followed Christ, let us all follow Christ, our precious Lord and Savior. Well, and and that's what we mean when we say he got it in his blood. And you and I have had this experience. We meet people. We are humbled. Yes. And 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 not in a bad way, like we want to beat ourselves up, but just to say these these lovely brothers and sisters do so much with often so much less yeah. than we have. Yeah. Um, it's inspiring to say there are not obstacles we can't overcome. Yeah. It is just such an encouragement. Greg, why don't you pray for us <laughs> as we begin? Father, thank you 
that you've allowed us to minister in the Thai language for 30 years. Thank you for the faithfulness of, of those leaders like the one we just highlighted and so many hundreds of others that we work with around the world. And we pray that you would challenge and bless us in that great way to serve you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength as we study your word today in Jesus' name, amen. Here's our study of Song of Solomon on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we come today to the fifth chapter of the Song of Solomon at verse 6. And we'll probably have just two more studies in this little book. And somebody's going to say, where do we go from here? Well, we'll follow now our usual procedure. We return to the New Testament We go forward on two fronts in this five-year program, and we'll go, of course, to the epistle to the Colossians. Now, as we come here, I need to remind you again that we have here the romance, the love story, and that's what it is, this Song of Solomon, with this Shulamite girl, a girl from up in the hill country of Ephraim, in a family of tenant farmers, poor Now Solomon wins her heart, brings her to the palace in Jerusalem. And this bride, I tell you, in these songs here, she reveals how she's impressed by everything that is there, by the palace and the throne and the table that Solomon prepared for them to eat. And, of course, the wonderful worship and so many other things and Then we had this lovely story last time about this bride. He came to rouse her up to come with him because his head was wet with the dew. And the reason was he was out yonder looking for the sheep that was lost because, you remember, he was a shepherd. And also he was out on the king's business. And she didn't want to get out of bed. She didn't even want to open the door because, you see, the floor in that day generally was a dirt floor, and she didn't want to get her feet dirty. She'd wash them when she got in bed. She wanted to stay there. And what a picture of the church today. Church doesn't go very far from home. Very few churches get out from and under the shadow of the church steeple. They don't like to get off of the church step. In fact, that's pretty far for some of them to go as a result. They've lost fellowship with the Lord Jesus. Actually, they have. And I think that's one of those little foxes that destroy the grapes today. We lose our fellowship when we step out of the will of God. That's what it means to quench the Spirit. You quench the Spirit when you won't go where He wants you to go and do what He wants you to do. And so here, this bridegroom, and he did a lovely thing. It was a custom of that day. He came and put on the handle of the door the myrrh and the frankincense, and the sweet odor filled the room. And when she got up, she put her hand on the handle, and there was all of this frankincense and myrrh. And she looked for him then. She opened the door and called to him. And we read now in verse 6, I opened to my beloved... But my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. Fellowship's broken, you see, at a time like that. And I personally believe that there are a great many Christians today that have done two things, that they have grieved the Spirit, and that's sin in their lives, and they've quenched the Spirit, and that means they've stepped out of the will of God, not obedient to Him. And that'll break fellowship with Him. And That causes us to lose our joy. Now, it doesn't mean we'll lose our salvation, but we'll sure lose the joy of our salvation. And it doesn't mean that we've lost the Holy Spirit even. It simply means this. Paul put it like this. Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. He didn't say that you'd grieve the Holy Spirit away. You wouldn't do that. You just lose your fellowship. And A great many Christians are in that position today. I had a man tell me some time ago, he says, you know, you speak of the reality of Christ in your life. He said, I don't have it. 
And what a dead giveaway that was. Well, I know that man. He's a friend of mine. And I could tell him very easily, in, in a very loving manner, I trust, that he's out of the will of God. I don't think there's any question about that. He has attempted to say that what he's doing is the will of God, and the reason is because that's what he wants to do. And he very definitely admits that, that this is the thing he wants to do. Well, it may not always be the will of God for us. And so the bride here, she's lost fellowship. I tell you, if you're not doing anything today for the Lord, you haven't lost your salvation, but you sure missed a whole lot. You are missing something. You're missing a sweet fellowship with him. Now, verse 7, the watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. You see, it was not safe to be on the streets of Jerusalem in that day. That was 1,000 B.C., 3,000 years ago. It wasn't safe on the streets of Jerusalem at night. And today, it's not safe on the streets of Los Angeles at night and in some places in the daytime. So we've come a long ways, haven't we? Only thing is, we've been going around in a circle, and we seem to be right back where man was thousands of years ago. And it wasn't safe far out there. And I wonder today how many realize how impotent and powerless we are if we attempt to go out on our own. Now, I'm afraid that a great deal of enthusiasm is being worked up to do just one thing, and that is to knock on doors. Now, that's sure been neglected a long time, but I'm confident that there are certain people who ought not to be knocking on doors. And there are certain ones that I do not think ought to be witnessing at all. I have a friend that is in another state, and when I'm there, he always wants me to play golf with him, and I do. I enjoy being with him. But he has no tact whatsoever, and yet he has a zeal to witness for the Lord. I have seen him make waitresses angry. I've seen him make strangers that we meet angry. And he says, you know, says there's sure a lot of opposition against the gospel today, isn't there? Well, I couldn't help but say to him, I don't think there's as much opposition as you think there is. I said, it might have something to do with the way that we present it. And then I called his attention. I said, you know, one of the most hostile persons that the Lord Jesus ever approached was that woman, that Samaritan woman, came down to the well. She was defiant. And I said, have you ever noticed how he approached her? He didn't approach her as if he's got something and he's going to cram it down her throat. He said to her, you give me to drink. <laughs> oh, my. He takes the lowly place and he asks her for something. Then he very courteously says, Oh, I could have given you water if you'd have asked for it. And finally, she asked for it. And he didn't offer it till she asked for it. My friend, you and I need to, before we attempt to cram the gospel down the throats of some folk, we need to give them a little appetite for it. Maybe they could see something in us. So many of them don't see anything in us, but maybe they ought to see something first. Maybe they ought to find out whether it's real in our hearts and lives first. And so we need to be very careful about that. But there is today an opposition to the Word of God. And here we find that it comes from unexpected quarters. And I don't know, the watchman there, he should have been the one to encourage this girl. But the thing was that they smote me, they wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. And this girl's having a difficult time, by the way, not being protected by the ones that should protect it. Poor preachers find themselves deserted by a board that's turned against them because he may be preaching a little too strong for them. 
the thing is that the opposition comes from those sometimes who should be protecting. Now, this girl, this bride, she meets the daughters of Jerusalem. And we have here now an antiphony. That means she sings one part, they sing another part. That sounds like an opera, does it not? Now she says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if ye find my beloved, that ye tell him that I am sick of love. If you find him, tell him how much I miss him, how much I love him, and let him know that I'm looking for him. Now that is the thought that you have at this particular juncture. Now the daughters of Jerusalem, they speak and answer her. And very candidly, I would say they're rather skeptical here. She's in love with him, and now the garden has lost its fragrance, and the myrrh and the frankincense don't mean much to her, and the beauty of the flowers have withered. May I say to you that she misses him, and they are a little skeptical. Did you note what they say now? What is thy beloved more than another beloved? Who is this Jesus anyway? What makes you think Jesus is different from anyone else? There have been other great religious leaders. They're great also. Why do you think that Jesus is different? Why do you think that he is who he claims to be? Believe me, friends, there's a lot of skepticism on the outside today. And the tragedy of the hour is that The church is not answering Jesus Christ's superstar. The church doesn't seem to have an answer for that today. In fact, it's being played in a great many churches, and it's blasphemy because it denies the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it asks the question and then attempts to answer it. What is thy beloved more than another beloved? Well, Jesus is just a man. That's what the play says. He's just a man. (laughs) May I say to you, there's been a lot of discussion about him, and there's more controversy about him than any person that ever lived. He's the most controversial figure in history. Now, if you don't believe it, let me ask you a question. Would you want to get excited about Julius Caesar today? Suppose someone would say he's a rascal. Would you want to argue? I don't know about you. I would not let him... If they want to think that, fine. He probably was. But suppose somebody thinks that he's a saint. You even want to argue that. I wouldn't argue that. He could have been a saint. I don't think so. But nevertheless, it's no reason to argue, is it? But the minute you mention Jesus Christ, I tell you, the human family chooses upside. It's interesting. God made it that way. God wouldn't even let Pilate off easy. Pilate called for a basin of water, washed his hands. He said, I won't have anything to do with him. He just thought that because the oldest creed in the church for 1,900 years has been saying, crucified under Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate, you didn't wash your hands. You made a decision. He forced you to make a decision, though you thought he was the prisoner and you were the judge. But he was the judge and you were the prisoner. And today, every man has to make a decision. What is thy beloved more than another beloved? O thou fairest among women, what is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost so charge us? Why do you think he's different? In these anthologies of religion today, they have the great religious leaders, they say, the founders of religion, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, Gandhi, and Buddha, and all the rest. May I say to you, the early church, according to Tertullian, when the persecution began, he said that the great problem was that the early church would rather die than have Jesus put down on a plane with the heathen deities of the Roman Empire And they just refused to take a pinch of incense and put it down before the image of a Caesar. They just didn't do it. And why? Because their beloved was different. And the bride now is going to answer, and she's going to 
answer their skepticism. You think that they cooled her off and that somehow or another she's going to tone it down. You're wrong. Will you notice what she says? My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. His head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers. His lips like lilies, dropping sweet-smelling myrrh. His hands are as gold rings set with the burl. His belly is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. His legs are as pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet. Yea, he's altogether lovely. This is my beloved and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. This is the one. And now she waxes eloquent concerning him. And there's something here that's so obvious. And this is very much in detail. She describes him in minute detail. You know what that means? That means that she knew him. <laughs> oh, how she knew him. And my friend, if you're going to defend Jesus Christ today and witness for him, you'll need to know him. And not only know him, to be able to wax eloquent on his behalf. And when I say eloquent, I do not mean in language, but in enthusiasm and excitement and love and zeal for his person. You need not only know him, you must love him. That is the challenge that you find here. I tell you, the bride knew him. <laughs> she knew him, and she loved him. And she says that he's white and ruddy, and he's the chiefest among 10,000. What a picture you have here. And I want to share with you today what some others have said about the person of Christ, just in his humanity. He's altogether lovely. And Dr. C.I. Schofield, who gave the notes on the Schofield Bible at first, he's the one that wrote this. And I'm going to share a little of it with you. All other greatness has been marred by littleness. All other wisdom has been flawed by folly. All other goodness has been tainted by imperfection. Jesus Christ remains the only being of whom without gross flattery it could be asserted he's altogether lovely. The loveliness of Christ. First of all, it seems to me this loveliness of Christ consists in his perfect humanity. I wonder if I'm understood. I do not now mean that he was a perfect human, but that he was perfectly human in everything but our sins and our evil natures. He is one of us. He grew in stature and in grace he labored and wept and prayed and loved. He was tempted in all points as we are, sin apart. With Thomas we confess him, Lord and God. We adore and revere him. But, beloved, there's no other who establishes with us such intimacy, who comes so close to these human hearts of ours, no one in the universe of whom we are so little afraid. He enters as simply and naturally into our 20th century lives as if he had been reared in the same street. He's not one of the ancients. How wholesomely and genuinely human he is. Martha scolds him. John, who has seen him raise the dead, still the tempest, and talk with Moses and Elijah on the mount, does not hesitate to make a pill of his breast at supper. Peter will not let him wash his feet, but afterwards wants his head and hands included in the ablution. They ask him foolish questions, rebuke him and venerate him, adore him all in a breath. And he calls them by their first names and tells them to fear not and assures them of his love. And in all this, he seems to me altogether lovely. 
He is altogether lovely. Is he altogether lovely to you? That's important. But we'll leave off there today and pick up right there next time. May God richly bless you, my beloved. To find a resource by Dr. McGee to deepen your study of God's Word, visit us at ttb.org. Or if you've got questions about this fruitful ministry, just call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. I'm Steve Schwetz. God bless you today as you walk with Him. Today's study with Dr. J. Vernon McGee is brought to you by Through the Bible, and it's made possible by the generous prayer and financial investments from listeners like you on the Bible bus all around the world.